takes a second to kick in. Uh, no, I'm not. I will be on the microphone right here. Oh, okay. So now you hear it's probably a lot better now, right? It takes a second to kick okay. in. And there it is. Took a second to kick in. Oh, uh, doors are locked. Hang on a second, folks. Somebody's trying to get in and we have the door shut. The Lord shut the door. Who is it? You know what? The Lord shut the door. That's Genesis. Okay, good to see you. It's a wet, rainy day out there. Oh, it's miserable out here today. So good to see you. I didn't, I didn't hug them. Oh, you didn't hug them. Okay. Because they're soaked. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, let you get your seat. We'll open up in a word of prayer. Yep. No problem. Glad you're here. Better late than never. Better late than really late. <laughs> you're the closest and you're the latest. <laughs> okay. Let's pray. Okay. Lord, thank you for our time together. We pray that you just help us to uh, understand your word more clearly, apply it to our lives. Lord, thank you for each one here and the way that we can study your word and just learn more about you. So we pray your blessing and our time together in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, this is Easter Sunday coming up. So just in mind, no meeting on Sunday night. Okay, no meeting on Sunday night. Uh, however, I will be, we're leaving today to go to Canada. So I'll be speaking Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And Patty reminded me that there is a link on the Bridalwood Bible Chapel website where you can catch that whole conference. I'm not just the only speaker. Uh, there's another speaker, Sam McHale. Some of you have seen him over uh, at Keswick when we spoke on Zoom. He's a chiro not chiropractor, optometrist from the Caribbean. So uh, he will be the other speaker for that conference. So if you're interested in getting those details, we have the website for you. And Patty has that information. Contact her too. Okay, so no meeting this Sunday night just so you know, in place at Keswick. Uh, we'll pick it up the following week with Sandy Branner as our, I mean, as Sandy Branner, sorry, um, with Scott Dunkerton as our speaker. Okay, so Matthew, uh, I'm Matthew, Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine is what we're looking at. And uh, we are, we started the transfiguration. Why is it called the transfiguration? Who knows? We call it the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Why is it called the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus changed. changed, right. He was transfigured. So it's the Lord being transfigured. That's right. So because uh, we use these terms so quickly and then we forget or don't know really why we use those terms. But it was because the Lord was transfigured at that, that location. And he was transfigured because... He had already stated in chapter eight that some of his disciples would not pass away before they saw the kingdom of God. And you would think because of this, the wording of that, it sounds like they wouldn't die years later, they would see the kingdom. And so some have taken from that verse that the Lord's kingdom came into view, you know, some years later. And that would seem to seem to make sense. But what it was, was that some of them, three of them in particular, Peter, James, and John, would see the kingdom glory of Christ when he was transfigured on the mount. And that's what we see in the opening verses. So we've already looked at this, but we'll just do a brief overview again. Someone has called it the account of three, two, one. All right. It's three men, Peter, James, and John, seeing two men, Moses and Elijah, and Christ, of course, being uh, the preeminent one. I've learned on my computer when I raise my hand like this, balloons come up on my website. They're on the Zoom. Do you see that? And that's that's Mac doing that when I put my hands up like that. All of a sudden, these pictures of balloons, you don't see it over there, but the people online do. Okay, so uh, it's the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, interestingly, here in these verses, verse 2, notice it says, after six days, 
Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Now, if you look at Luke's account, it says eight days, right there. Contradiction in the Bible, right? So why would one say eight days and another says six? Anybody thought about that? Do you have a quick answer for that? Say an atheist walked in the room right there and says, there's your Bible, contradiction right there, six days, eight days. How would you respond to that? Anybody got an answer? I wouldn't either. Except that, when you pick up the commentaries, they do give a good answer for that. Uh, probably part of one day, part of another day, six full days. But if you have part of a day, part of a day on either end, then it would be eight days. It touches eight days. Legitimately, you could say eight days. And uh, you could also say six days. Now, how would I make the equivalent analogy? Somebody says, okay, Mark, uh, I heard you have a Bible study. I says, yeah, basically go from one to three. That's the Bible study. But the Bible study is really 1.30 to 2.30. But I look at it as somewhere in, after one o'clock, I arrive on the premises, and I do. Today, it was quarter after one. I arrived here. By the time I leave, it's three o'clock. So in my schedule, I have blocked out one to three on the Bible study. But really, the Bible study is 1.30 to 2.30. So I touch a little bit of that hour but I carve out two hours. So what do you have for a Bible study, Mark? Well, I have it at Crestwood Manor and Terrace Lounge, and we go from one to three. But I don't really go one to three, I go 130 to 230. So in a sense, that's what's happening here, six days, eight days. A lot of times it's like that in the scriptures. Wouldn't yeah. that kind of be the same way as yes. the resurrection? Yes, absolutely, right. Touches part of each one of those days. So, I mean, some people make a strong argument, say, hey, it really happened on Thursday. Some, like M.R. Dahan, who started the uh, Our Family, no, Our Daily Bread radio ministry called Radio Bible Class, later OBD, Our Daily Bread, um, he pushed for a Wednesday crucifixion and then a Sunday resurrection. So there are some people, good people, who said Wednesday, some people say Thursday, most say Friday because it touches three days in the Jewish calendar or however you want to call it, calendar, clock, whatever, chronology. So uh, you do have to take those things into account. And, you know, there could be, you know, people would argue about this and that three days, three nights, just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days, three nights. Even so uh, shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth, three days, three nights. You know, and they make the argument, well, how can you have three days and three nights? You can have three days and two nights, that touches, but three days, three nights. So you do have that argument, and it always happens if you're really thinking things through this time of year, that argument comes up. But generally speaking, Friday on the cross, first thing in the morning, nine o'clock, on the cross until three, the time of the evening sacrifice in Jewish economy. And so at three o'clock, is when the Passover lamb was killed. You know, it's called twilight. The actual time is twilight. So I'm getting all these um, some sort of notifications here. Um, twilight is three o'clock. So um, if you looked at Exodus chapter 12, when they give the instructions on the killing of the Passover lamb, they say it shall be killed at twilight. Twilight in the Jewish economy in that time of year is three o'clock. All right. But the ironic thing is the Passover lamb is being killed when over here, outside the camp, outside the city, in a place called Golgotha, which is on the outskirts of the city, the lamb of God was being sacrificed. So the contrast between the little lamb, Passover lamb, and the lamb of God taking place, same time. So, and then, of course, down across before evening, the second part of the evening would be by six o'clock. So, uh, important to make that distinction. Anybody got any questions on that? Are we good on that? Okay. All right. So, uh, six days, verse two, eight days over in the book of Luke. That's how you reconcile those things. So, you let them up to a high mountain probably Mount Hermon. 
Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. And it wasn't too far from the events of Peter confessing the Lord. Who do men say that I am? That took place at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is right by Mount Hermon. So good reason to understand that they're at Mount Hermon. And verse three, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white. The clothes changed on him. Okay, not just his countenance. That's what Luke says. Luke's gospel says his face began to glow or glisten, but also his clothing. So apparently in his kingdom glory, Christ in his kingdom glory will look like he looked here on the Mount of Transfiguration. In other words, glowing garments. You see that in Revelation chapter one. He's got these garments and he's in his role as the great high priest. So, so that's why it's called a transfiguration because he's transfigured, and transfigured, not them. I don't know why this is doing this to me. Keeps blinking. Okay, yes, Barb, go ahead with your question. Go ahead. Yeah. How did the disciples know what Elijah and Moses looked like? Yeah, that's a good question. So Barb is asking a question if you didn't hear it online here. Um, how did they know what Moses looked like and what Elijah looked like? Because they identified him right there. So let's take this step back. Way in which, which could communicate. right, right. That's what I'm thinking, but I don't know. If that's right. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that necessarily, but I can tell you this: there are some people who say, "Well, we will not recognize other people in heaven." You ever hear that argument? We won't recognize other people in heaven. Did you ever hear that? I've heard that we will. Yeah. yeah, I've heard that we will, but there's some people who say we won't. But here's a text that indicates you do know people and what they look like in heaven. Or take that verse from 1 Corinthians 13. Then shall we know, even as we're also known. That verse, 1 Corinthians 13. Then shall we know, even as we're also known. So, uh, so recognition of other people in heaven seems to be a reality. Based on this, based on verse Corinthians 13, um, you know, people can argue back and forth. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, they shall see Abraham afar off. So how do they know it's Abraham? You know, talking about, I, they shall behold the king and see a land that's very far off, including Abraham. So, um, so to me, it seems that you can, you can recognize people in glory so anybody else have a comment they want to add on that anybody there bob jerry the yes, Holy Spirit. go ahead go ahead jerry yeah it's just the holy spirit the holy spirit tells them who they were right yeah, so the Holy Spirit could be involved. Sure, there might be knowledge that's given to us in heaven that we don't have here. Right. Suzanne had something to add. Just a little something. I just want to say they were really dazzling white and so bright. They, they couldn't look at him then, really. Yeah, well, they were able to see him here, right? How bright it was, I don't know if it outshone the sun. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's not that bright in this situation because they could see who he is, right? Uh, look, it says in verse four, Elijah appeared to them with Moses. So these are the two great men, Moses and Elijah. In Revelation chapter 11, in the future uh, tribulation, it says there are going to be two witnesses. They're not... Fire drill. Fire drill. Boy, that was scary. I was like, what was going on there? So we have to go out here. Well, uh, hang on a second, folks. I'm going to pause this. <laughs> we have our doors right here, so we're okay, I guess. Okay.
Okay. Shh, 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 shh. Only a drill. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. You were talking at the time. It was only a drill. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so it's all done. My ears are still ringing. So let me just turn this up a little bit more. Testing, testing. Okay. Testing, testing. My wife thought it was something in, in our house. <laughs> you thought you were having something there, huh? Yes. Okay, so these are the two uh, men, Elijah and Moses, who are huge, prominent in the minds of Israelites because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. So if you remember when the Lord was walking on the road to, uh, to Emmaus, that uh, he talked to him about everything concerning himself and the law and the prophets. So in the Jewish Bible, uh, Moses would be the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, you know, the first five books. And then Elijah, even though he wasn't a writing prophet, there's no book of Elijah. So Elijah didn't write, but he was a powerful prophet. And so from their standpoint, the prophets uh, begin with Elijah. You know, so I assume it's like first Kings when Elijah steps on the scene in chapter 17. So Elijah and Moses and those two witnesses that are unnamed in Revelation 11, as I was saying before the bell was so rudely interrupted us here. Um, they do miracles that are similar to Moses and Elijah. So some people feel that in the tribulation period during a very difficult time, uh, these two witnesses for God are, are make themselves known and they are Moses and Elijah, even though they're not named because they do the same thing. Uh, turn the water into blood. That's what Moses did uh, at a certain point when he was doing the 10 plagues and also called down fire from heaven. That's what Elijah did on top of Mount Carmel, first Kings chapter 18. So, uh, so you have those situations coming on. So, Okay, so um, now Peter answered, verse five, said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. That's good old Peter coming in with these general bland statements. And he says, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. What's wrong with that? With the equal, right, making them equal, which is totally wrong. And we'll see how that's wrong because he did not know what to say for they were greatly afraid. You know, if you don't know what to say, better not to say it, right? <laughs> and a cloud came and overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. So as I mentioned in the last meeting, this is the third time, second time rather, second time that there's a voice that comes out of heaven. The first one was at his baptism the second one is here at the Transfiguration, kind of a midpoint in his earthly ministry. And there'd be another one in John chapter 12, verse 28, I think it is, where he, there, the voice comes from heaven again. God speaks again from heaven, confirming the son. This is my beloved son, hear him. So three times, beginning, middle, end highlighting the consistency of the life of Christ and his ministry. Okay, so let's uh, keep your finger right here. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's see what it says about this event. Now, Peter is writing. Don't forget, Peter, James, and John is one of the three men that are up there. Well, five altogether, but two of them are, you know, uh, have been in glory, let's say. Three are living, Peter, James, and John. So Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. He says, moreover, I will be careful, Peter is saying, to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So Peter's saying, before I die, I'm going to write about these things. I want you to be reminded of them. 
For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, he's not talking when he was walking along and with the Lord during any moment in the earthly ministry of Christ. He's talking about this event on the mountain that we're looking at here in Mark chapter 9. Eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's a specific reference to this event, transfiguration. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, that's heaven. Heaven is referred to here as the excellent glory. And here are the words. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So Peter here in 2 Peter chapter 1 is writing about these events on the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 18, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So that's Peter's testimony, that he was there in person, heard a voice, saw the Lord in his excellent majesty, and there was the uh, voice that was from the excellent glory that came down. And Peter is saying, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. This is what we've actually saw with our own eyes and ears. And it occurred on the mount. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, confirm these events from the hand of Peter in writing about these things. Okay, so we didn't cover that the last time we met, so. Okay, so let's go back to uh, Mark chapter 9. Any questions on any of this? No? Okay. So when they go into the cloud, it overshadowed them. A voice comes out. This is my beloved son. Verse 8. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. So that is the appearance of Christ by himself, standing alone. There's a hymn. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the... View, the joy, what joy the view affords. I think that's the wording of it. So, um, verse 8. Okay, they're still doing some more work on his alarm system here. So, it's a good reminder, though, you go into a cloud, any trial. Here's a practical application. Go into any trial or problem in your life. Uh, the Lord is there with you. Because remember, it says here, Jesus only Jesus with themselves. So Jesus did not leave them. He was there as they went into the cloud. He won't leave us when we go into a cloud either. So verse 9, Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So he wanted to wait until he had risen from the dead before they made these things known because the Lord did not come to feed people and do all these things, primarily came to atone for sin. So the victory would have been over the grave and over sin and not over the Romans or anybody else. All right, so that's, that's the emphasis there. So verse 10, they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Now, they were familiar with the scriptures. Does anybody know where that is? Elijah coming first? Anybody have an idea where that is? I want to just take a second. Let's take a look at that. Keep your finger right here in Mark 9. <clears throat> we'll go back to Malachi. Okay, so this is what's being talked about here. Malachi chapter 4. That's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, and you'll see it says in verse 5, these are the last words of the Old Testament, last words of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, 
and verse 5. Behold, God says, this is God speaking, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, is that dealing with the witnesses in Revelation 11? You know, it doesn't say it. Maybe. Maybe there's something else. But the promise at the end of the Old Testament is God would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest they come and strike the earth with a curse. That's how the Old Testament ends. Now, just flip over a couple pages to Matthew chapter 1. So Matthew chapter 1, uh, I say chapter 1, sorry, chapter 3, just a couple pages ahead to Matthew chapter 3. And let me just see here if there's some other verse I want to just catch. Okay, so Matthew chapter 3, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And John the Baptist here is introduced in Matthew's gospel, chapter 3. And he says, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he who is spoken by the prophet Isaiah. This is another prophecy dealing with John the Baptist. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. That's how Elijah was dressed uh, with a leather belt and camel's hair. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So all of this takes place. John the Baptist comes in like a firebrand and he confronts the establishment and with power and real vigor uh, condemns them and uh, is coming in the power and spirit of Elijah, dressed with uh, this clothing of camel's hair, it says, and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. That's exactly how Elijah is dressed in 2 Kings chapter 1. There's a king of Israel, and they say, there's a guy, there's a prophet out, outside. And they say, who is he? He says, I don't know, but he's dressed in camel's hair. So that's how Elijah is described, 2 Kings 1. Same appearance almost like John the Baptist. So it's just interesting when you connect all these dots around, right? Okay, so what questions do we have? Yeah, I, I'm thinking that these prophets, Elijah and John the Baptist, are saying repent because the dreadful day of the Lord is the great tribulation, is it not? It's the judgments so of God, yes. By giving people a chance to repent before the uh, judgment of God, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, to me, it's it's a clear indication. Yes, that that's it. That is John the Baptist, and John the Baptist comes in the form of Elijah, so to speak. Avoid the, the tribulation, right? By repenting, right, and, and turning to the Lord, right. Okay, so let's finish up that portion, verse ten. They kept this word to themselves, questioned what the rising of the dead meant. They asked him, saying, "Who? Do, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? Then he, that is the Lord, answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and restores all things. How is it that? Uh, how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come. So he says, also come, in the person of John the Baptist. And they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. So now there's nothing written that the forerunner, namely John the Baptist, would be killed. You can't look in the Old Testament and find any verse that says the one who is preparing the way in the wilderness, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's the forerunner. That's John the Baptist. No question about it. Isaiah uh, refers to him. 
but there's no verse that says that John the Baptist would be executed, but we see him executed. Okay, so there's no verse that says that. But the Lord is saying, okay, Elijah, in a sense, has come. Now, he doesn't say that prophecy in the future has been fulfilled with John the Baptist. He says that is indeed coming. But also I say to you that the spirit of Elijah has come in the person of John. So he's kind of affirming both things, a future event, but John the Baptist did in essence uh, fulfill in, in, a, in a typical way, symbolic way, the uh, Elijah coming. Hope I didn't lose anybody on that one. You follow that? So John the Baptist has come. He comes in the form of Elijah, dressed like him, sounds like him, does things like him. He's not John the Baptist. He's not Elijah, but he's like Elijah. And yet the Lord didn't disclaim the fact that Elijah would still come in the future. You follow on that? Does it make sense? Make sense, Bob? <laughs> Okay. So this is all precision here, but the point of the matter is transfiguration. The Lord is showing his kingdom glory that is yet to come. And he showed it to his disciples in fulfillment of the promise made in the previous chapter. Yes, Andy. Uh, I don't know if this has a bearing on anything, but I know from past that you like things like this. <laughs> I'm that, about to say it's symbolic okay. thing. You like to say, oh, well, it means this or it means that. How come uh, Elijah was taken up? Didn't he die a normal death like everyone else? Right. Everyone else right. In, in, in the chariots of fire. Yet here, there is nothing even referred to or even any picture of in, in, in Jesus' time. Is, does that mean anything? I'm not sure I'm following you 100% on it. Just a, just a point of his life. And it's, it's over. I'm not sure I'm following you completely on that. Say well, that again. They, talk, they show that Elijah. They talk about it again. You know, he's there with Moses Right. right, sure. And you hear uh, that uh, Jesus is saying, well, Elijah has already come. Right. So we're again, we're getting into symbolism of who Elijah is. Uh, he's coming to our time. Right. And we say that uh, he, he wants to bring about repentance. He's getting the people ready to right. for Jesus and whatever is going to happen. But, we're not getting, I don't know if there is anything, is there anything to the fact that Elisha was caught up in heaven, that was it, we didn't see him anymore, and now we see him again, Right. Uh, here, his spirit, uh, I don't know if he's real, uh, you know, if he's flesh and bone, or something like that, um, but, but they don't even have him referred to hints about anything that he was taken up. Uh, that's, that's a spectacular thing that people said. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't even, I don't know how to answer you on that one other than just Elijah was, I was, I was <laughs> Elijah uh, was raptured in a sense, and he's a picture of that rapture taken up without dying. So, everything else about Elijah, right? Right, right. You would think something like that, that he was taken up as a live human being into heaven, right? To be with God would be something that uh, would be symbolic of something, right? I would think that Jesus might mention something about that, or, or I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have a question on that? Yeah. So Elijah definitely was taken up in heaven. No question. Is the rapture. Enoch and Elijah both are translated. Um, you know, all I can say is 
Well, I, there's nothing more I can say other than they were both translated. No death is experienced by them. But one thing I do want to mention here is, remember Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land, right? Remember that? Why was he not allowed to go into the promised land? Yeah, right. The first time he struck the rock and it came, water came out. 40 years later, in a whole nother location, he struck the rock, but he was told to speak to it. And he struck it once and he struck it again and water came out. That was a great lesson right there. First off, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, I mean, chapter 10, it says, Christ is that rock and that spiritual rock and that rock that followed them. So there's a the Jewish tradition is that there is this rock that followed the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years because that rock was here and then the rock 40 years later was there and the rock gave forth water. That's not like this rock creeped along in the wilderness. I don't know what, what it was, but anyway, that rock that followed them is it says. First Corinthians 10. But either way, Moses was told not to strike the rock, just speak to it. Because when he was, when he struck the rock the first time, that's a wonderful picture type of Christ. Struck by, smitten by the Lord, Isaiah 53, to bring forth life giving water, atone for our sins. But when he was told to speak to the rock, and he struck it, he kind of ruined the type, as they call it. Theologians call it ruining the type. And for that, he was barred from going into the promised land. Okay. Christians need to be reminded, believers need to be reminded that all we need to do is talk to the Lord and he'll provide for our needs because he's already suffered and died <clears throat> on the cross for our sins. But Moses didn't do that, and so he was disobedient. Because he was disobedient, he wasn't allowed to go in. But guess where he is now? He's in the land. The promised land is the land of Israel. So he wasn't allowed to go into the land in this life. But in glory, he's in the land. The other part of the story is there. That's a good, that's a good point, right? He's with the Lord in glory so he's in the land but not in this life so going to be with the lord in glory wraps up all the loose ends we might say i guess you understand what i'm saying does that make sense to you barb does that make sense that you hear what i'm pointing out no you can't hear that okay all right oh sorry sorry yeah yeah i have to get him but is that, is that understood? Am I making that clear? It's the Lord finishing the story, if you will, in glory. All right, then shall we know, even as we're also known. Um, all those wonderful things the Lord makes known to us and finishes the end of the story in glory. So regardless of how it finishes here on earth, when we're in glory, Everything is fulfilled. I don't know if I can say it any more than that. Does that make sense? Am I making sense to people? I would say amen to that. So Moses is in glory and he's there. But um, again, the Lord is standing out amongst them, above them. He's above them. That's the point. Not on the same level like Peter is trying to do it. So that's the transfiguration. Okay, now here's a practical point. What happens after this mountaintop experience? You have a trial, major trial. Look at verse 14. When he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered, and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. Sounds like epilepsy to me, right? But we don't know. But it's a, a fer, referred to here as demon possession. It says, so I spoke to your disciples that you should cast it, that they should cast it out, 
but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, the Lord, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Now, the Lord knows all this, but he's asking him. And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Boy, that's a great verse. Should have that underlined in your Bible, right? If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believe. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You should have that underlined in your Bible, right? Because we're, we're like that. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So we all have doubt mingled with faith. And that's what the Lord is. I mean, that's what this experience that the Lord has with this man is, is, is doing here. Showing us that we are, at times, we're unbelieving believers, right? When Jesus saw the people uh, came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him and became as one dead. And so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him up, took him by the hand, lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So this case, it was demon possession. Other cases when there's health situations, it's just a health situation. Guy was born blind, guy had a withered hand, and it's not attributed to demon possession. This is, but not the other ones. So it would be wrong to say that any malady out there is all demon possession. Maybe some of it is, some may not be. Some may just be health situations, but this one is. But either way, the Lord intervened and the father brought the child to the Lord and the Lord dealt with that. So the Lord can do these things and shows his power once again over the supernatural, in addition to being over the natural when he calmed the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee. But it's a reminder to us that at the bottom of the mountaintop experience is sometimes a trial. And so whenever you have the conferences, there's always the downtime afterwards. Temptation can come in, you know, all that type of thing. You got to be on your guard when you have this great spiritual victory. There's always at the trough, there's always the possibility of failure. And that's what the disciples need to be reminded of. And we need to be reminded of it as well. Any comments? Any questions? I think when I was growing up, people thought that if you had epilepsy, yeah. there was a feeling of shame like you had done something bad right. you were a sinner. Right. I got that impression from my parents and their friends that you... You had to be ashamed if you were an epileptic, but I think today we think of it as a medical disease mostly. Right, yeah, yeah. Now it doesn't say he had epilepsy here, it just says that he did these things which we look at and say, ooh, it sounds like epilepsy. So, but this one is attributed to demon, demonic influence here. So that's the thing to keep in mind. Okay, so that's uh, chapter nine, verse 29. So, verse 30, when they departed from there and passed through Galilee, he did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Well, yeah, they may not understand how it all unfold, but they should have understood what he was saying. He's going to be killed and he would rise again. And they didn't want to ask any further, I guess. Maybe sometimes we don't want to ask because we're afraid what we will hear. Uh, maybe that was their situation. 
Verse 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child, set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So that's pretty easy to understand. Yes. Jerry or uh, Bob, did you have something? No. No? Okay. Um, so um, it's pretty easy to understand. Whoever receives this child receives me. Whoever receives me receives my father. And the Lord would uh, underscore this principle in other scriptures. The words that he speaks were words that were given to him from the Father. So therefore, whoever receives him receives the Father. Whoever rejects the Son rejects God. So the person out there, the atheist or anybody else that says no to Christ, he was just a man, they're saying no to God. And don't they may not realize it, but that's what's going on. Okay, so let's move to verse 38. John answered him saying, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus says, do not forbid him for no one works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. And whoever gives, up, uh, gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, that's a key phrase, because you belong to Christ. Assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Notice that verse 44, where that description is. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where, verse 46, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. A quote again, second time. Verse 44 and 46. And then verse 47, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into fire. Verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So there it is, 44, 46, 48, same verse, same wording, three times. And verse 49, everyone who will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, and if the salt loses its flavor, <clears throat> how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Okay, so what does that verse mean? And all these other things. I can tell you this, it doesn't mean this. I was at a camp up by Binghamton one time, and a guy was hired there to be, uh, you know, somebody to work on staff, care, uh, groundskeeper and stuff like that. And we were eating uh, lunch and the guy was pouring salt like copiously on his meal, taking a salt shaker, just putting all. And we're like, what are you doing? That's not good for you. He says, the Bible says salt is good. Verse 50, salt is good. We said, no, it's not, not like that. <laughs> he's pouring it on, just pouring it on, saying it's not a problem. And he's using the verse out of context right there. Salt is good. Salt's a preservative. Salt adds flavor to food. Uh, salt is good from that standpoint, not over excess, like he was saying. But if the salt loses its flavor, or your verse may say savor, you know, its, its ability to preserve, its ability to enhance flavor, whatever, 
how will you season it? Well, it begs the question. I mean, obviously the answer is you can't. But it's have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So what does that mean? Have salt in yourselves. Does anybody want to take a shot at that? What's that mean? Have salt in yourselves. You want to take a guess? You have understanding if you know the Lord um, yeah. as you're working for Him and so forth. Yeah. Um, that's the salt that you have, and you should continue to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So you would have a witness in yourself, I guess, is what you would say. Is that is that how you're saying that? More or less, yes. Yeah. So have salt in yourselves, have that preserved, preserving aspect of things. You know, some people have said it this way, that the Christian um, is really salt in society because we're, so, we're told that we're the salt of the earth. So the idea is that because of your witness, you have a preserving element to culture. Uh, in other words, when the church is removed from this scene, that's when it's going to all fall apart. Because whether the world acknowledges or not, Christians are a conscience for the world. Christians keep it kind of from falling apart because of their testimony for Christ. When that is removed, then there will be chaos. But only believers understand this when they read the Bible. Unbelievers don't. So uh, the preserving element of Christians in society will not be there when the church is removed. That's when things really fall apart. And yeah. If your word about the Lord or your soul, as you talk to someone, if it's not accepted, don't, yeah. don't get bummed out. Yeah, right. Because of, not yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So don't take it personally, right? Yeah. So salt also has a element that creates thirst. So the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to pray for others that, uh, and we should be working in our own lives that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Christians by their testimony can create an interest and a thirst for righteousness. Somebody says, wow, I saw that person, their life is all together and uh, you know, I really admire them. And I want to know more about their religion. That might be the wording they would use. And you can create a thirst for righteousness by your faithful witness for Christ. And that's by having salt in yourselves. And he says also have peace with one another. So that might be an application there. It's a good, good thing to consider. Now, there might be some people who would say, well, if you have a hand that offends, or if you have a foot that sins, takes you into the wrong places, or you have an eye that offends, you should destroy those parts of your anatomy. And there are medical records of people who in distress have done these things, thinking that, oh, it's better to enter into life maimed than not, almost as if you had an offending hand and were cut off or a foot or an eye plucked, that that would gain you entrance into heaven. But that's not the entrance into heaven. The entrance into heaven we know is having your sins atoned for by the blood of Christ. That's the only way. But these verses right here, some have said are pretty serious sounding verses. Self-mutilation to earn favor in the eyes of God. Well, this is a case where you have to compare scripture with scripture and say, okay, how do you get to heaven? Well, it's not by good works or the avoidance of bad works, which is what these verses would seem to indicate. It would be more of um, faith in Christ and his finished work than it would be these items. But these are hard verses. But what it does tell us is that the hand and the foot and the eye can cause us to sin. And so we need the Lord's help on that. Anybody want to comment on those verses? Yes, Andy. Yeah, I'm not commenting on those verses. I'm still 
the last verse of the whole. Have peace with one another, salt in yourselves. And be at peace with one another. And when you read that, and be <coughs> at peace with one another, I would think that the salt is enough. You got good salt of the word, your salt, your right. belief, your faith, your goodness that God has given you is enough. Right. And then I try to think of, well, if he says, be at peace with one another, is he sort of giving a follow-up for stumbling, you know, cutting hands and putting out eyes? Is that something uh, that he's trying to extend a, a conversation about? Or the little ones that he was just talking about? And yeah. Show that you should be humble like them? Why, it seems to me, in my way of talking, right. in my vernacular, right. be at peace with one another is from left field. Right, right. I just pulled that in. I said, how yeah. does that fit in? Fit in you know there, huh? Yeah. About? I mean, it would seem to me... Seems disconnected. Salt is enough. Yeah. yeah. You know what? You, you're doing okay. You're just doing fine. Yeah. Then he throws that in. So he didn't throw it in. He added it. On purpose for some reason. Right. Yeah, it's a good insight you bring out. I can't answer it because it does seem to be disconnected a little bit, but have salt in yourselves, that takes care of it. But peace with one another. Um I don't I, I can't answer that. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. That is enough. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. Right. That's how one two two parts to the equation. God, and you're seasoned, you're going to experience fire in your testimony, in your life. Yeah. But, you know, love your neighbor. That's yourself. Yeah. I'm relating the two somehow yeah. in my head. Yeah. Okay, Bob had something. Go ahead, Bob. I was I was going to say uh, earlier when we were, you, you were speaking about Elias and, and John. Uh, yep. It, it, I was getting it, but every time I get confused, I go to Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And also, I go to when I get confused, uh, Psalm 131, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters, or in things too high for me. That's that's my go-to. If I get confused, like, you know what? I'll lean on that and I'll get I'll get to it later. <laughs> okay. You know? Hey, good. Okay, that's good. Good verse. Okay, uh, Janice, you had something? Well, I was just wondering whether, going back to what Sam was saying about being at peace with one another, if that doesn't reflect back to verse 38 when they were complaining that somebody Else was doing miracles and curing okay, right. Uh, well, Disagreements, that. right there. Yep. Have salt in yourselves. Have that preserving influence, but be at peace with one another. Maybe there's some connection there that uh, we should maintain our character. And one of the ways to do that is make sure that we're at peace with one another. I, you know, it's a tough, it tough verse. Yeah. Well, yeah. Healing. Yeah. Just, don't worry about that. Be at peace with yourself and with him. Yeah. Maybe talk to him and find out how he's doing this. Or that's him. good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, one comment there about that, those verses that you just mentioned, Janice, is that there was this uh, a person who was performing a miracle in Christ's name, and but they didn't go along with these disciples. And of course, there's another instance where James and John saw that they didn't, the Samaritans didn't give them credit. And then the Lord said, well, they're not against us. So, you know, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. So this is a great set of verses right here that often is alluded to or referred to when you have people from different denominations in the Christian life who will do things a little different than the way you do. Them. Now, the problem is when we've been brought into a fellowship, a lot of times that fellowship 
will teach you from their standpoint. So all you know is that standpoint. And so when you have experience with some others who are not from that standpoint, you were taught this is the way, no question about it. And they come in and they do something else. You say, oh, that's, that's wrong. That's, uh, you must be part of a cult or you, you're just off base. And there's a verse that I always like, Bob just explained, he's got a go-to verse. I have a go-to verse for that. Philippians chapter three says, if you've any of you be other minded, even God shall make that known to you. There's differences of opinion of good Christians who differ on baptism, the mode of baptism. Now I'm convinced in my mind thoroughly that baptism is full immersion. I have my reasons for that. The Lord, John chapter three, went to a certain place, Salem, because there was much water there. You don't need to have a lot of water if you're sprinkling or if you're pouring, you don't need that. But you need a lot of water if you've got to go down underneath it, full immersion. So that is a verse. And there's other verses too that would seem to support that. Jesus came up out of the river, you know. So uh, you don't need to come up out of the river if you're being poured or sprinkled. So I'm very convinced of that. But there's wonderful Christians who feel, oh, sprinkling is all that's needed. You can find the word sprinkling in the Bible, they might say. And so there's difference of opinion. That shouldn't mean that they're considered the enemy or they consider me the enemy because they're still doing it in the name of Christ. So that's what it says here. They did a miracle in my name. So that's the key thing. So there's going to be differences of opinion. How to take the offering, whether you take offerings in public arena or you do it privately amongst the believers. That's how we do it at our chapel. We never pass a bag around. I was just reading something. Somebody made a comment on uh, some Christian YouTube, and he says, uh, these Christians, obviously he wasn't a Christian. He says they're only in it for the, in essence, they're only in it for the money. They're money grubbing. You know, this is the comment that was made by this person. And, you know, and that's what is viewed by the unsaved community out there, that you're only in it for the money. Things like what I do right here, YouTube, you're only in it because, you know, you want to promote yourself. That's the common criticism of the unsafe. So you work to avoid that. And so some people with the uh, offerings say you don't take offerings in public. Somebody who says, oh, it's okay to take them in public. So you have differences of opinions. Not that they're enemies. So have salt in yourselves. Be a preserving influence, create the thirst for righteousness, and be at peace with others. You know? So that's how you see it seems to reconcile that way to me. So anybody else got any comments to add to that? I, I think your salt is uh the salt is a metaphor, you know, just like the light. Because our yeah. light comes before men. That's how People see the light in us, and they can be, they can be saved. So it's right. it's a metaphor, just like light is a metaphor. Right. So so again, uh, used in, symbolically as a preservative or for light, for being a witness. Did somebody else? Yeah, Barb. I wanted to go back to their worm. The worm. The verses on the worm. Okay, there's a the question, verse 44. internal suffering in hell, and the fire represents external suffering. Okay. But I think there's going to be a little more to that. Okay, so Barb is asking the question, why is the reference to worm does not die and the fire is not quenched? Well, we know the fire is not quenched, but we don't think of worms. Okay, worms do not die. I can't answer that other than saying this that hell is real and the fire is not quenched and life doesn't disappear because there's some people who feel that when a person dies even a christian there's some christians out there that feel that when you die you're annihilated and that's the doctrine of annihilationalism which is not biblical and the position of a person who holds that says that when even when a christian dies that's it they're gone 
but it does away with verses about heaven and being with the Lord and Moses and Elijah right here in the Mount of Transfiguration. So we know there's life beyond. As a matter of fact, all the Old Testament heroes of the faith, it says when they died, they were gathered to their people. So there's a verse saying you're gathered to people in heaven. Paul, when he was praying for the Ephesians in chapter three, he says, for this cause, I bow my knee to the family that is in heaven and on earth. So there's two families, two audiences, those that are in heaven and those are on earth. So the idea that that's glory, of course, same thing in hell, it's real and life doesn't stop. The worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So ongoing. You know, it's, it's very interesting. I'm glad you said that. And uh, of course, I'm going to ask a very hard question, I think. <clears throat> when I read verse 49, I was yeah. just going over and saying, yeah. OK, for everyone who will be salted with fire, what came to my mind immediately was trials. Yes, it's right. always associated yeah. with trials. However, since you're going into this whole explanation in verse 48, right. where he's saying, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Right. Now, I don't understand. It, what kind of fire is he talking about? Is it hell fire? Or is he talking about trial fire? In other words, you have maybe he means your trial fire, which on earth is, is for a period of time, but the trial fire in hell is forever. The trials are there forever. Maybe right. But right. He, he goes from one end to another. And he's, yep. ah, with salt, with fire, salt. I fire. know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we got to think about, right? So go home and do some study on that one. I think it's hellfire that's referred to in that verse 30, 44, 46, 48. Fire is not quenched. Worm does not die. I think it's that. But verse 49, everyone who will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. So there are some manuscripts that question whether or not some of that wording in there with fire should even be there. New Testament, I mean, uh, there's a certain manuscript that eliminates everything after that, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Well, it's in the Bible here, King James, I trust it's, you know, it's in those proper manuscripts, so we don't want to get into that discussion right now, but um, the idea is that there is some sort of perhaps application verse 49 to the personal believer, but I do think that verse 48, 46, 44 all have to do with hellfire because that's a context of the exhortation, the hand, the foot, the eye. Yeah. Can I just ask this yeah. quick one? I just want, when I see things like this, like Bob Knight said, yeah. you know, he, he just gives yeah. it to the Lord and said, I don't understand. <laughs> right. Why? Three times it's recorded that he said this. Yeah. Why does the Lord give us things like that. Yes. And it's the the, the best Christian minds, I'm sure, struggle with it. To figure out, yeah. Why did you say that for? <laughs> All right. I wonder, why does the Lord do that? I why, know. Why, you know, he, he wants to help us yep. to understand with teaching, but yet this is beyond me. I don't know yeah. what, what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that keeps us coming back and studying it and analyzing it. And I think that's why he does these things because it seems to be disconnected, but it's the Lord, it's the word. And so it's not, we just are not on that level that we have to keep coming back and asking the Lord for help on it. So yes, Laura, In, we'll finish up with this. Uh, this yep. King James verse two, and it refers you back to Isaiah 66. Verse 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpse of men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die, right. and their fire is not quenched, it shall be a horn to the flesh. So is that, that, the reference to the 
worms. Would that be like the sins? I don't know. I never thought about that. Well, it just hit me now. When yeah. I was, when I was reading this reference back in, yeah. in Isaiah. Yeah. Because it, it, because it Isaiah. 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 Yeah. 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 Isaiah. Really figured out. Full, fully understood. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, our, we're well past our time, so we should close in prayer and be on our way. But mm -hmm. uh, good things, and that's what Bible study is all about. I mean, we're analyzing it verse by verse, word by word. And you just do this a lot, you have a lot of knowledge from the word. Yeah. Okay, so Lord, thank you for our time together and pray you bless our study in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, good, good, good to see study, you, Brother Bart. Okay, thanks. Bye now. Bob Knight says hello. <laughs> okay.